Now, the problem with the fat cells that if during the first part your growth, the fat cells increase in number. And there is a limitation to that, and then your fat cell size increase. But size can increase up to 20 times. Now, once the size has increased and you are going on taking, then they, again the number will increase, and that number can increase to up to 1,000 folds. And the problem is that once your fat cells increases in number, you cannot go back by dieting and exercise. The moment you leave it, it will go back to its, because the fat cells are not going to decrease. One of the largest endocrine organ in the body is the fats or the adipocytes. This slide, is, I know, is very complex. But the reason I'm showing you is that the, how many hormones are being secreted by these fat cells, like adiponectin, which has a role in atherosclerosis, diabetes, the resistin, then is the leptin, which I'll be talking about, the visafatin, visfatin, and then it controls the fatty acids, cholesterol, chemokines, and interleukins. I know it's very complicated, but don't ignore the adipocytes. They are dangerous, and they are the largest endocrine organs of the body. And then what happens? See, this is a normal lean with normal metabolic functions. There are two types of cells. One is M2 macrophages and the CD4. Now, if you have more of M2 macrophage and more of CD4, then you have better metabolic control. You have better blood vessels. As you can see here, that the blood vessels are much better. They are not constricted. Whereas, if you have got more of M1 and CD8, then you have the inflammations, and this gives you a crown-like appearance, and your blood vessels are thinned out. So that's what happens, that when your fat is increased, your M2 cells are decreased, CD4 converts into CD8, then you have inflammations, and what you are seeing is all the inflammatory process of the obesity. And then what the adipokines can do, it can also cause the heart failure either directly or through the renal effects. I'm not going into the details of that. And then comes the nervous system. There are a lot of hormones. One is the orixogenic hormones. That means which helps us to increase our appetite, like neurogenic peptide Y and agouti-related pro proteins and a lot of others. And then is the anorexigenic arm. So obesity is an interplay of these two arms. Coming to the genetic obesity, see, a lot of genes are there. As I told you, the rare monogenic obesities. It's rare because we cannot diagnose them. We see a lot of children below two years of age who are on breastfed but hugely obese. We don't know whether they have a leptin problem or not. We don't know whether there is a, mono, a melanocortin-4 receptor problem or not, proopio melanocortin deficiency or not, and then a lot of other monogenic syndromes are there. And then the polygenic ones, one of these important genes is the FTO fat and obesity gene, which I will discuss a little bit afterwards. Now, how do you know that when you get an obese child, that whether this child is a genetic or whether this child is a, because of the increased food intake? Now, the genetic obesity has some characteristics. They are usually short. They are, have a little bit of developmental delay. They can have eye problem. They can have hearing problem. So it is always better to check them thoroughly because a lot of genetic obesity has got retinitis pigmentosa also. They can have cardiac problems. They can have skeletal problems. Like in Barden beetle syndrome, you will find that they have the polydactyly. So <clears throat> they have hypogonadism, hypotonia, microcephaly, and others. And this is, again, we do neglect very frequently that we don't do the proper growth chart. I will show you three growth charts. The first one, you see this child is obese. This child is obese. But this child is short, and he's maintaining. 
So this is a genetic obesity. What you can see in the next one, that this child's weight is more, his height is also more. So there are very few conditions where it is, they are tall and they are also obese. And if you find that, most likely it is exogenous. But the example, uh, exceptions are Marshall Smith syndrome or Weber syndrome, where they can be tall and fat, like uh, your Soto syndrome, they can be tall and fat. And then is the last one, is the endocrine one, where this child is increasing in weight, but his height is decreasing. So that's an endocrine which you get in hypothyroidism. So the growth chart in a child, in any child is actually important and more so in obesity. And how it is helpful. See, I show you this, this child, I was looking right from the couple of months age, and you see that the way the child was growing, and growing and growing, till the child was diagnosed here. The child was hypotonic, needed some tube feeding, was diagnosed as meconium aspiration syndrome, came to me with fever, which is not being controlled for a long time, and then the child looks like this. On one side, actually, the child had the conjunctivitis. This child's iris is less colored. Now, remember that if you have a chromosome 15 problem where the tyrosine is also there, the color are usually lighter. Like in Prader-Willi, Angelman syndrome, it will be light colored. And the child also has a hypogonadism. The problem with this child was that the ch child was having temperature because his hypothalamus was not working. When we admitted the child to an AC room, air conditioned room, the fever subsided. And then we, when we did the uh, uh, methylation study for uh, Prader-Willi, it was diagnosed as <laughs> Prader-Willi syndrome. This is another girl. This is, you see that the birth weight was low and the way the child was growing. Initially, you become happy that my child is growing. But later on, when you find that this child uh, is slightly developmentally delayed, and you do this, uh, uh, you see the chromosome 15 defect with the fish study. So you find an obese uh, child, and how do you proceed? You do a karyotype, definitely. You do a fish and or the methylation. Methylation studies are the best for the Prader-Willi syndrome because it will detect all types of defects. Majority of the defects will be diagnosed by methylation studies. You can also detect the fragile X syndrome. But if it is negative, and if you have got the retinitis pigmentosa, as I told you, that they look at the retinitis pigmentosa, the Lawrence Moon beetle or Bardet beetle, whatever the terminology you use, it, is, uh, it will be diagnosed. And then you are also diagnosed uh, your BFL syndrome and uh, Wilson-Turner syndrome. But if they have the uh, photophobia and nystagmus, there are Alstrom, Beamon, a lot of others. But when you don't have anything, when everything is negative, then you think of that whether the leptin is defective or not. And now you can do leptin levels of in India also. If your leptin level is less, then you think of that it's a leptin deficiency. But if your everything is like leptin, but the leptin levels are more or normal, then you think it's a leptin receptor defect. And leptin receptor defects has been found in about 8% of the cases. So it's again, is not that less, the leptin receptors is only that we don't diagnose, so we cannot think of that. So this is a barded beetle syndrome. You see that the polydactyly uh, and little bit of hypogonadism. This is a, uh, no, this is an Alstrom syndrome where there is abnormal deposition of fat, deep set eyes, so Alstrom syndrome is one. And then you see the fat is there, but it's an abnormal way. Look at the fat depositions in this pelvis part. Look at the fat depositions. This is carbohydrate deficient, glycoprotein deficiency. So where you get all these features of inverted nipples and... Uh, and then this is very interesting that the smith magnus syndrome, which is a chromosome 17 defect, I don't have... I am yet to see a um, smith magnus syndrome. I'm trying to look for it. They have rage attacks, and they have a very peculiar uh, uh, symptom of putting objects into their various orifices. In all the orifices, they will put the objects, which is called polyembolocoimania. 
So uh, if you find like this that he puts an object, think of the smith magnus syndrome. And then talking a little bit about leptin, is that the leptin was discovered in 1994. And it is produced primarily in fat cells, placenta, and the stomach probably. And the large fat cells produce more leptin than small ones, and serum leptin concentrations are decreased. Now, how leptin decreases food intake, decreases the content of neuropeptide Y, as I have told you in the anorexigenic arm, and increases the content of pro melanocortin. And this is uh, Sadab Faruqi. He is the person in Oxford who works on leptin. Um, he's a uh, master in leptin deficiency. And see, this child, when he was infused with leptin, he becomes like this. It's really, really very rewarding uh, disease.